In this video, we're going to talk about the curl of a vector field. This video is part of my full course in vector calculus, and the playlist for that is down in the description. Now, what I want to begin with is just some vector field in three dimensions, a vector field with three different components, and it looks like some sort of swirly mess. And then I'm going to define the following thing. This is called the curl of a vector field, and it's written curl of just the vector field f. And well, it looks like a relatively messy algebraic expression, and don't worry, in a few minutes we're going to do something to clean it up and make this look a lot simpler. But right now, this is how it's defined. It's a vector, it's got an i hat, a j hat, and a k hat component. Each of those vectors is a difference of two different partial derivatives. And basically, if you give me some vector field f, I can give you another vector field, the curl of f. But what does that mean? Now, when you look at this expression, there might be some part of it that you have seen before, in particular, the third component. We saw this back when we were talking about circulation, circulation density, and the relationship between them that was expressed by Green's theorem. This was all something that we did in the two-dimensional case when we were talking about the plane, but now we're talking about the three-dimensional case. So what was circulation density in the plane? Well, okay, let me give a planar vector field, and I'm going to imagine a tiny, tiny little rectangle. I imagine this as small as can be, infinitesimally small. Then what we had derived previously was that the circulation density, in other words, the flow around this curve per unit area, was expressed by this particular difference of partial derivatives. We'd spend a bunch of time analyzing why that was true. And the way I think about this is that if I'm imagining my vector field as, say, a velocity field and some particles moving around in it, so what I'm doing when I take the circulation around this very small loop is I'm basically trying to measure the degree to which the vector field is curling at that particular point in the limit as this loop gets smaller and smaller. And this is why we're going to call this a part of the larger thing called curl. So curl is the three-dimensional analog of this two-dimensional circulation density. So Returning back to our definition with the three different components, one other way to interpret the third component is, let me just imagine, I'm just going to do a slice, a slice parallel to the xy plane. So I've got all my vectors looking on the slice, and I've ignored what their third component is, what their k-hat component is, I've just sort of leveled them all off. Indeed, if I take a slice parallel to the xy plane, then I would get some normal vector to that xy plane, which I can call the k-hat vector. So what I have at this point is that the vector field is causing this curling in this plane that's parallel to the xy plane. I'm going to put up a, a little uh, spinner here. I don't know if this is clear. What I'm trying to imagine is like a little paddle wheel. This paddle has a fixed axis here, parallel to the k hat, and then it's allowed to freely spin parallel to the xy plane. And so if you imagine taking this into some body of water, for example, and you put this little spinner in, well, how much would it spin? That is what the third component, the k hat component of this curl is representing. Likewise, if I have my spinner, which is pointing straight up, I could ask, well, my spinner pointed to the side, that is, my axis is parallel to the i-hat direction, so it's allowed to spin in the y-z plane, well, that would represent the first component of the curl, how much spinning is allowed to happen there. And then in general, if I just take the spinner and I put it in the water, and the only thing I fix is that the actual point where it's at, so it's allowed to spin, but also the axis is allowed to point wherever, then what the spinner would do is it would end up fixing itself in some direction, depending on what the vector field was doing, if it wasn't changing in time. It would fix itself, and then it would spin around in that axis. Well, that axis is the curl. Okay, so that's a bit of a geometric interpretation of what curl is doing, but how do I actually compute it in a way that's a bit more sensible than this? So I want to introduce you to the del symbol. This is shorthand for take the partial derivative with respect to x in the i hat, plus the partial derivative with respect to y in the j hat, and the partial derivative with respect to z in the k hat. We've seen this before. We've seen this del operator before. For example, we've seen that the gradient of f, del applied to f, is the partial derivative of f with respect to x in the i hat, f with respect to y in the j hat, and f with respect to z in the k hat. So what kind of object is del? Well, I said the word operator. An operator is something that takes some function and spits out another function. An operator eats functions and, and gives out other functions. So the del operator takes in the scalar function f and outputs the vector function gradient of f. Now, gradient of f here is only relevant because it's something we've seen in the past. Now, going towards curl here, I'm going to do a completely different operation. This operation is what I'm going to call 
del cross f. It is the cross product of this operator with the vector field f. And so I do my normal cross product trick of making a determinant, i hat, j hat, k hat in the first row. Second row is the first thing in the cross product, which is partial respect to x, y, and z, respectively. And then the three components of my field, m, n, and p, go in the third row. Compute all of this out. It's just a cross product. And, well, I get exactly what we had before, what we previously called the curl. So now what this operator is doing is it's taking the vector field f and spitting out this new vector field, the curl of f. And so I often don't bother remembering this formula with the m's and the p's and the y's and the z's. I mean, you can if you want to, it's totally fine. I just remember del cross f and I just compute out that determinant when I want to go and figure out what the curl is going to be. Now, I'm going to do one last thing playing around with the idea of curl to specifically focus on what is the curl of the gradient of f. Now, whether, whether it's del cross the gradient of f. Well, I mean, I can just write out what this determinant is, exactly as I said before. I can put the partials in the second line, and the gradient of f has components fx, fy, and fz in the third line. So, executing this particular cross product, the first component, well, it's fzy minus fyz, as in the order of the partials have been commuted. And in fact, this is true for each component. And so as a result, this is zero, provided you have some nice conditions on your f. For example, it has to have continuous mixed second partial derivatives. If that's the case, then the curl of the gradient of f is just zero. Now, why is this so nice? Well, we've seen previously that the gradient of f was associated to conservative vector fields. So a vector field was conservative if it could be written as the gradient of a scalar potential function. And indeed, conservative was a really nice property because it meant that any line integral was independent of the path. It only depended on the endpoints. We had, for example, the fundamental theorem of line integrals that only applied for conservative fields. And conservative fields are everywhere because things like, for example, the gravitational field or the electric field are both conservative fields. And so because of the computation we just did that showed that the curl was going to be zero if you had a field that could be written as the gradient of f, aka conservative, so this means that these common fields like the gravitation field or the electric field, these have no curl. And then I can also connect this to something we did back with conservative fields because, okay, well, the definition as we just seen was, here's the longer version of what the curl is saying that's equal to zero. But look at those three components. You might recognize these. We had a test for conservativeness previously. It was saying each of these three components had to be zero. In other words, the pair of partials have to be equal. So I can now restate my test for conservativeness. If the curl of a vector field is zero, there's no curling at any particular point, then the vector field is conservative. All right, I hope you enjoyed this introduction to the curl of a vector field. In our next video, we're going to do Stokes' theorem, perhaps the highlight of our vector calculus course. And in Stokes' theorem, we're going to be able to connect this notion of curl to the circulation around the boundary of some surface. So that and more coming up in future videos.